Um, keep as few rules on it as possible. Um, these rules uh, impede commerce, impede exploration, impede human ideas. And the network really, for me, is a way to share ideas and argue ideas out and discuss ideas and image ideas, right? Because Second Life now is I can build a world and my world might be different from the world you are comfortable living in. And if you try to put, I, put rules on my world, that'll impede my exploration of what the future might be. Um, my hope that people can connect with each other in, in new ways and, and get over their differences, get over the, the, you know, get over some of the social differences that are out there. You know, my wife's Iranian and, and their society is, is, believes different things from my society here. And the only way we're going to ever bridge that, you know, in a peaceful way is to connect with each other and, and find some common ground where we can discuss things openly and in a transparent way otherwise we're you know we're just gonna resort to what we're doing in Iraq shooting each other you know and that's not the kind of future I want for my son so. the usual fears were uh, where my ideas are going to be used against me you know um, you know, and so you already on online you go through a self-censoring process because you know it's going to end up on search engines like Google and MSN and Yahoo. You know, so you don't share if you're doing anything weird or different from society. You, you're very careful about sharing that because it's so easy now to use technology to find the people who stand out. You know, the people who say they're using drugs. Hey, do a search. Who's saying they're using dope today? You know, <laughs> and find their IP address and find their address and let's go raid their house. You know, so um, technology can be used to to you know cut down the weird ones and pick on the minorities in a in a new way. And you're seeing governments do that, right? China does that. They pick on the weird ones and the, and the guys who are out there advocating for change. And when pe powerful people don't like to see change in a society, they use tools to find them and you know, stop that kind of uh, advocacy. That's really tough because it, it's tough to know where a, a disruptive technology is going to come from. You know, for instance, we all know that flexible screens are coming soon. You know, two, five, ten years from now. I, I, but what what is that going to mean when there's cheap flexible screens that don't take much power? You know, can you wrap one on a pole? Can you can you wrap one on this microphone? Can you have the microphone behave differently because it has some way to communicate back? with me what it, it thinks, you know, because <laughs> it might have some intelligence now and say, hey, you're not close enough to the microphone, get closer, <laughs> you know, or, or it's, hey, you're too close, <laughs> get back, you know, it might have, you know, some sort of feedback to give me, you know, when it, ha when it has that kind of uh, communication device. In my home, you know, 15 years from now, I expect to see monitors everywhere, uh, you know, in other words, information and ideas are going to be able to tran to follow me around my house. Um, I can stop at my stove and, a, and a, a recipe could appear, you know, and I could maybe talk to my house and say, hey, I, I don't want chicken pie tonight. I want a salad or I want, you know, I want to make some cookies. You know, tell me how to make some cookies and a new recipe might appear right there. Um, and that, that mixture of, you know, right now Second Life is something you do on a little screen, you know. And you have to dive into that screen to, you know, get into a virtual world. Well, what if my house has almost monitors on every wall? You go to the bathroom and there's monitors, and you go into the living room and there's monitors surrounding you. Um, what happens then? Because now the virtual world and the real world could sort of combine, could collide, and uh, that'll be interesting to watch. What happens? You know, at Microsoft we have um, engineers who are playing with. Uh, 
monitor technology that'll allow you to put monitors, low cost monitors on all your walls, particularly in your office where you're going to sit all day long. And so you could build a holodeck, you know. <laughs> in fact, the guy who runs Microsoft Research is a big Star Trek fan. I wonder where he gets his ideas, you know. <laughs>
impl implementation. You don't know how it's going to be implemented, and you don't know if it's going to be low enough cost to have it go mass market. You know, another one's robotics, right? Look at the Sony robotics that they're the Sony and the Honda uh, robotic guys that today cost one hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars to build, but just do fantastic things. I mean, they can walk, they can run, they can hold things, they can walk upstairs, they can dance, they can move, they can be behave humanoid. You know, where is that going? What what will that mean to society? I don't know. You know, that's going to be a fascinating thing to watch in the next 15 years. Enabling. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's where I think, yeah, that's the one word. You know, it, it enables me to have experiences that I couldn't otherwise have. I mean, I, you know, compared, it, let's go back in time 100 years. That was right when the car came out, you know, or... We didn't have mass airplanes. We didn't have airplanes. We, you know, to go to Hawaii, for instance, would take a week on a ship. You know, having technology enables us to do new things and have new experiences that we just can't have today. And 